Well, I'm so glad to see everyone who came is here and you're able, and it's just a blessing. Uh, as, you, uh, as you already know, we have a number of our men that are on the retreat, so we're certainly grateful that they have had this wonderful opportunity, and we're certainly looking forward to having them back, so we pray for safety for them. But while we're here, we are just going to worship whether there's one or two or ten or fifty or whatever the Lord provides for us. Glad to see you all. Grateful uh, that you're here. So let's bow our heads and lift up our hearts. My Father, thank you once again for this wonderful day that you've given to us and this opportunity that we can look into your word once again. You bless us richly with the opportunity to worship, to praise, to learn, to draw close to you, and to be able to fellowship with one another in the Lord. What a blessing you have provided for us, and I'm so grateful for it. Now we ask the Spirit of God once again to open up our minds and hearts to those things that you have for us today. Through Jesus, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen. You know, one thing is for sure, while we may not always understand it, and at times not follow it as we should, as John had mentioned earlier, the word is absolutely trustworthy. Whatever he says is true, and whatever he promises will come to pass. I want to give you a couple of uh, scriptures here. One is in Josh 23, 14. It says this, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. What an amazing thing to be able to say that. That's just wonderful. And the other verse is 1 King 8. Then he stood and he blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. God's promises never fail. Amen? Amen? Never fail. Everything he says is wholly true. In scripture, you will find that God has made specific promises to his chosen people, Israel. Now, some of these promises were conditional, and by that we mean they're based on their behavior, or we could say they're based on the obedience to God's commands. There were, however, promises that were given to his chosen people that were unconditional, based solely on who God is, and not on what the Jews did or did not do. They're just based on what God has said. Were God, were God to fail in those promises, he would not be God. The unconditional promises given to the Jewish people came through what's called the Abrahamic covenant and included a great nation and personal blessings to Abraham himself, Genesis 12, 2. Also, divine favor to his friends and a curse to his enemies and blessings to all nations fulfilled through Christ, Genesis 12, 3. Everlasting possessions of the land known as Canaan, later called Palestine or Israel in Genesis 15, 18. Numerous prosperity promises, natural and spiritual in Genesis 13, 16 and 15, 5. He would be a father of many nations and kings through Ishmael and Isaac in Genesis 17, 4 and 16, and a special relationship, a special relationship 
with God in Genesis 17, 7. So let me just run down these real quick. Genesis 12, 2. I will make a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Genesis 13, 16. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Genesis 15, 5. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Genesis 17, 4 and 16. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you should be a father of many nations, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her, that I may bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings and peoples shall be from her. And Genesis 17, 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Now, other covenants were made through Moses and David and Solomon, and a new covenant, a new testament was clearly made with the house of Israel in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with who? The house of Israel and with the house of Israel. Judah, and this covenant will be something that is continually only to them. Now, Israel as a nation has not received, not received the benefits of this covenant made with them by God. We have who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have received the benefits. And obviously then, God cannot be finished with the nation of Israel. If God were through with his chosen nation, his word would actually end up being false. If America is the new Israel of God, as some Mormons teach, or that the Jehovah Witnesses are spiritual Israel, or that the New Testament church is the Israel of the Old Testament, then God has not fulfilled his word nor his promise. So contrary to what people sometimes teach about God, he is always going to be faithful to his word. Always going to be faithful to his word. Therefore, God cannot possibly be finished with the literal nation of Israel. So let's stand and enter into a new chapter and read our text for today. This is going to be found in Romans. And we are in a new chapter. We finished up chapter 10. Now we're into chapter 11. And we're reading the first 10 verses. And here we... Here we have this. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. And I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, works is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. And the rest were blinded, just as this is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David said, 
Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their backs always. Please be seated. Jews and Gentiles have been brought into the church of Jesus Christ. The body of Christ is composed of born again believers, and it matters nothing to God of what denomination or ethnic background you are. Does this mean that God has cast off his chosen nation, Israel, his ancient people? Undoubtedly, God has changed his method of dealing with man so that it is no longer necessary to approach him through sacrifices of Israel. The Lamb of God has died and taken away the sins of the world, John 1, He has fulfilled the law. God has thrown off the altar, the priesthood, and the temple, all of which was under Judaism. God now lives in the hearts of those people who are made partakers of the divine nature in regeneration or new birth from Christ. The Lord will no longer use any building as his dwelling place. It is now individuals, very important, individuals who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. There has been a dispensational change. God is no longer dealing with man through Israel. He is now using what? The church. He is now using the church. And because there has been a change, is God through with the people whom he chose in the Old Testament. After all, hasn't God said to them, they are not my people, I will not have pity on them. I will scatter them like leaves driven by the wind all over the world. And if you just look around, haven't we seen that? Just look at history. Haven't you seen that? These people have been driven all over the world for centuries. And many people look at these truths and say, Israel no longer has a place in the plan of God, but has been replaced by the church. However, if you have that opinion, you would be incorrect. I want to read a very interesting passage of Scripture. It's in Nehemiah. A little bit long, but I'll just kind of read it through. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you, cast your law behind your backs, and killed your prophets, and testified against them to turn them to yourself. And they worked great provocations. Therefore, you deliver them into the hands of their enemies who opposed them. And in time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from, uh, you heard from heaven. And according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they again did evil before you. Therefore, you left them in the hands of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried out to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to your mercies. And you testified against them that you might bring them back to your law. Yet they acted proudly and did not heed your commandments, but sinned against your judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they shrugged their shoulders, stiffened their necks, and would not hear. Yet, for many years, you had patience with them and testified against them by your spirit in your prophets, yet they would not listen. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them 
for you are God, gracious and merciful. If you ever needed a passage of scripture that actually sums up the will and role of God with the Jewish people, we just read it. We just read a great, great passage that sums up how God has been dealing with Israel and the Jewish people for centuries. Because of God's promise to Abraham and to his descendants through Isaac, the son of promise, the nation of Israel has always been and always will be divinely preserved. Always. Otherwise, God could not fulfill his irrevocable promises to his people. He caused Israel to outlast all the nations who were contemporary with her, and he still has preserved her to this day. And we mentioned it in our Sunday school class, and we mentioned it several times before. In 1948, what happened? He brought these people back into their own land and as an independent and recognized state among the nations of the world. God's character, his integrity, trustworthiness, and faithfulness depend on his continued preservation of the Jewish people. God has obligated himself to ultimately redeem the nation of Israel and to establish her as a purified and glorious kingdom above all others in the world. God has promised to bless all people of the world through Abraham and his descendants. The fulfillment of that promise culminates in the second coming of the Messiah to Jerusalem. Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the house rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through these mountain valleys, for the mountain valley shall reach to Aziel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord, my God, will come, and all the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But at evening time it will happen that it will be light. And in that day it, sh it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. The people of promise will not be forsaken. That is a truth that you can rest assured on. The people of promise will never, ever be forsaken. And here in Romans 11, our text, our text, that is what is being pointed out. And this is so important for us to grasp because it helps us under, understand and make distinctions between the church and Israel. So once again, very briefly, I say then, has God cast away his people? The answer is certainly not. No. There has been a change in God's methods, but never in God's final objective. 
In looking at Israel, we see God still must show his righteousness by chastening those who forsake him, but he will still be gracious to a remnant who he will choose as the object of his grace. Illustration number one. Paul himself, Paul himself, Romans 11, 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. The first proof that God has not rejected his chosen people was that Paul not only was a believer in Jesus Christ, an apostle in the church, but he was an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Well, what's the big deal about all that? Well, Paul had been the foremost calculating, implacable, bloodthirsty enemy of the church. He was so offensive to believers that after Paul's conversion, only Barnabas, a peacemaker par excellence, could affect his acceptance. Everybody else rejected him. God had sovereignly sought him out and smote him on the Damascus Road and brought him stunned, shocked, and blind into the church. Paul, a hardened religious Jew with blood on his hands, came to Christ. By the authority of the word of God, we can say that no one is beyond the grace of God. Example, Paul. Amen? Of the 12 tribes of Israel, only two, Judah and Benjamin, remain to be the chief representatives of God's people after the Assyrian invasion of the northern ten tribes. Paul was a true Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, not a proselyte, but a pure, genuine Israelite. Paul's own salvation made it obvious that God could not possibly be rejecting all Jews. The second proof that God cites that the setting aside of Israel is only partial is the Lord has already preserved a remnant for himself. From Pentecost to the present day, Christ church has never been without believing Jews. Case in point is the story brought up in our text. Elijah, you know the story? God had answered spectacularly, sending fire to consume not only Elijah's sacrifice, but also the wood, the stone, the soil, and the water in the trench that he had offered up to the Lord. Elijah seized this opportunity, and he had 400 prophets of the priest of Baal killed. But it was the news that reached wicked Jezebel who then promised to kill Elijah. And undoubtedly exhausted, physically and emotionally, Elijah just takes off and runs for his life. He ends up at Mount Horeb, which is another name for Sinai, where God spoke to Moses. And then God asked Elijah, why are you here? Why are you here? To which the prophet responds, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel has forsaken your covenant, torn down your altar, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. How does God respond? You're not alone. Matter of fact, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. The point, a believing remnant is far from being an anomaly, 
but has actually always been the case. Romans 11, 5 and 6. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, works is no longer work. As is true of all believers in all ages, the believing remnant of Jews during Paul's day were not saved by virtue of their spiritual worthiness or moral good works, and obviously not simply on the basis of their racial descent, but according to God's gracious choice. What was true then is true now. God never leaves himself without a witness. He always has a faithful remnant chosen by himself as objects of his grace. One commentator points out, God doesn't choose this remnant on the basis of their works, but by his sovereign electing grace. A gift cannot be earned. What is free cannot be bought. What is unmerited cannot be deserved. And fortunately, God's choice was based on grace, not on works. Otherwise, no one could ever have been chosen. And he's absolutely right. So we thank God for grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And then 2 Timothy 1.9 says this, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not, in, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That's one of those, that blows my mind, doesn't it blow yours? That is just mind-blowing. Before the foundation of the world, God graciously predetermined his choice of those physical descendants of Abraham who would also become his spiritual descendants. For instance, while God's people were captive in Babylon, most of them refused to turn to God, but a few, the godly remnant that included people like Daniel and Ezekiel, and Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, and Mordecai, and Esther. What do these people do? They turn to God. They turn to God. God had a remnant. They, they are the ones we read about as far as the, that remain faithful to God. And when God became a man, and the apostate Israel nation rejected him and crucified him, but there was a godly remnant, Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, Simeon, Anna, the shepherds near Bethlehem. And before Pentecost, we read of a 120 in the upper room praying. After Pentecost, we read 3,000 that actually come to Christ. That's followed by an additional 5,000 that come to Christ. And no doubt, in the time of the Apostle John, when he's finishing penning, uh, uh, writing the book of Revelation, hundreds of thousands of Jews had come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. But the nation as a whole remained in unbelief. And the result in our text Romans chapters 11, 7 through 10. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded, just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them 
Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. The vast majority have failed to obtain righteousness because they sought it through self-effort, self-effort instead of through the finished work of Christ. The third proof, then, is that God setting aside of Israel is only partial. That the Lord has hardened the hearts of only those Jews who refused to believe. God has judicially blinded those whom he has chosen, his chosen people, who willfully blind themselves to God's grace. And God's judicial hardening of a man's heart is never, never separated from that man's hardening of his own heart. As with Pharaoh, you see, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then what, what did God do? Solidified it. Judas hardened his heart, as did many of many, many, many Jews. The fact remains, God hardens only those hearts who, in rejection of his gracious offer of righteousness, harden themselves to his grace. Verse 8 states that God abandoned them to a state of stupor. Just as it is written, God has given them to a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Abandoned to stupor means that they have become insensitive to spiritual realities. And there's a great danger, great danger, when one refuses to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they might lose the power to see him because they would not hear the pleading voice of God now. You could actually lose the opportunity in the future. They were smitten with spiritual deafness. That terrible judgment continues to this very day. The hardening of hearts by God was the result of their willful departure from God's grace. Acts 28, terrible way to end. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul and said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet of our father, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will not hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. The ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their ears, uh, with their eyes, and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that salvation of God has gone, has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. For the most part, the descendants of Abraham are rebels. And they deserve nothing but judgment. But it is to these unworthy people that he has decided to demonstrate his love, his grace, and his mercy to the world. God has punished Israel several times for their sins. The very thing which should have been a source of nourishment and blessings from the hand of God has turned against them. Our text, Romans eleven nine, 9, let their table become a snare. You notice that phrase? Let their table become a snare. Table means blessings from the hand of God. This table has turned into judgment, much like the Christians who come to the Lord's table, 
who come to the Lord's table unworthily eat and drink judgment to themselves. We'll read that section in just a little bit here. You see, what was meant to be blessings has turned to be a snare. Jesus Christ came to be the Savior. Instead, he will be Israel's judge. Israel's, Israel's rebellion and unbelief is nothing new. And because of it, their backs, verse 10, did you notice that? Verse 10, their backs, their backs have been bent under the weight of guilt and punishment for years and years and years. Matter of fact, their worst punishment lies ahead during the great tribulation. Zechariah 13. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. During the tribulation, two-thirds of the total population of the Jewish people will be struck down and they will perish. The Holocaust at World War II is nothing. Two-thirds of all Jews. But a surviving remnant will be restored for their covenant relationships with God. And we read in Revelation, in the midst of the tribulation that's going on, Revelation 7.14, or 7.4, it says, says this, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. A missionary corps of the redeemed. Jesus will be instrumental in the salvation of many Jews and Gentiles during the tribulation. 144,000 will be chosen of God to be the first fruits of a new redeemed Israel. God's promises are true. Finally, Israel will be the witness nation she refused to be in the Old Testament. So, if you ever need proof that God is real, look to the nation Israel. If you ever need proof that God is love, look to the nation Israel. If you ever need proof that God judges those who rebel against him, look to Israel. If you ever need evidence that God extends mercy to people who don't deserve it, look to Israel. If you ever need proof that the rejection of grace leads to hardened hearts, look to to Israel. If you ever need proof that blessings can turn to curses, look to Israel. If you ever need proof of God's elective grace, look to Israel. If you ever need evidence that only a remnant will be saved, look to Israel. If you ever need proof that God saves people from their sins, look to Israel. If you ever need proof that Christ will return to the earth a second time, look to Israel. For compelling evidence that God will keep his word, look to Israel. Israel. Let's pray. My Father, thank you so very much for your faithfulness. You are a God who is true to his word. And because you've been true to Israel, you will be true to your church. You will be true to those who have put their trust in you by the very grace 
that you have provided us, and we thank you for it. Through Jesus we pray, amen.